introduce Crystal now. Crystal is a Beaver Lake Cree First Nation activist, a Sierra Club Prairie activist, and the Peace River Tar Sands campaigner for the Indigenous Environmental Network in Alberta, Canada, and a mother of two. With infectious dedication and passion, Crystal is committed to restoring native treaty rights and stopping the expansion of the tar sands. Crystal is involved in the work of her nation to take the Canadian government to court over 17,000 treaty violations. In May 2008, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation filed a statement of claim in Alberta's Court of Queen's Bench, taking the government of Canada to court. In March 2012, they were granted a trial. This trial stands as a precedent for other oil sands rights violations. So let's give it up for Crystal, everybody. I was going to say, I'm the one with the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Dance, thank you. Hello, everyone. Mia, Crystal Lehman, and I come to you from the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, which is located in northeastern Alberta and in between two of the three tar sands deposits. Um, before I start, I want to, where's the live stream thing? Back there? I just want to, uh, this is the first time my children have ever watched me, so I want to give a shout out to my kids. I mean, they're the reasons. <laughs> yeah. They're the reason why I do what I do because I have an obligation to them. And I sat in a room yesterday with a bunch of very motivated and energetic young people. And I sat and I watched and witnessed what a movement looks like. And Ben, wherever you are out there, you did every young person on a global level justice. What you did in there, I wish it could have been recorded. Unfortunately, it wasn't. But that's, that's what leadership looks like. That's what mobilization looks like. Standing up for what you believe in regardless of what the consequences are going to be. There's also a young man, from my understanding, took a bunch of trains to get here from Colorado. That's commitment, yo. <laughs> I complained that I had to take a 13-hour flight. <laughs> um, and then the organizers of this uh, convergence, Hannah, you're amazing. Um, And for the rest of you, Kakio, all of you, you're amazing young people. So this is the end of what was like a whirlwind trip for me. I, um, there's, I know there was a lot of people in here that attended the Forward on Climate rally in DC on the 17th. Um, so that's where this whole thing started for me. I was one of the speakers at the rally. We then moved on and met with the EPA. We met with the State Department. And then now we were sitting the last night with the, or the night before, I don't know, when, I don't remember when it was. Um, the Board of Managers of Swarthmore. And Everything I've experienced since I've been out this way, since the 16th, that's a long time to leave my kids. But everything I experienced was really positive and uplifting. And that's, that's something to say when you feel positive about meeting with government officials. <laughs> but I tell you one thing. 
when I stepped on this campus, I was shocked to hear comments like, I think you're wasting your time. And these are verbatim comments. I think you're wasting your time. No, actually, I'm not. Because you see all these young people in here? Your energy is going in the wrong direction. No, your investment in dirty energy is going in the wrong direction. This one got me. This one got me. I don't get mad very, very often, and I'm a mom. But I, you know, like Lily always says, you got that mom look. Your, what did he say? I appreciate your stories, but they're not new stories. Hmm. The deliberate ignorance, that's motivation. Thank you for saying that. Because it's comments like that that motivate and mobilize people. So thank you for mobilizing and motivating even more people for deliberately ignorant comments like that. Keep saying things like that. I don't remember who, what the guy's name was, and I'm not, I would never do that. I would never call anybody out like that. But keep saying things like that, because that's going to keep fueling me. That's what's going to continue to make me move. That's what gives me the energy to leave my children. Comments like that. So keep doing that. The other comments that I found heavy. After sharing everything I did, the vulnerability as a human being, as a mother. We have children. It is a planetary issue, but there's always the but, right? <laughs> this one threw me off. <laughs> I'm on the environmental board of. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and then, to top it all off, <laughs> they, and they followed with the but. No, no. <laughs> but you just like, just if you're, you just need to go. <laughs> and this is the reason why we all need you in this movement. It's comments like that. It's things like that why you are all needed in this movement. And pro industry people know in my area when it comes to the tar sands, they know that they can only produce tar sands for 50 years. 50 years. That's in your lifetime. On top of the investment, and all those comments that you heard, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? That your parents, your aunties and your uncles, your grandparents think that way. That goes to show how much they care about you. That goes to show that they really honestly think that they are going to eat their money and drink their oil when this is all done. That's serious. That's a reality. Because right now, back home, we can't drink our water from the lake. We would never dare do that unless we want to get sick. And that was a really bold statement of me to make, but you know what? The fact that industry is taking 6.1 billion barrels a day of our fresh water and utilizing that for industry, I think I have every right to say something like that. Because your, the, these people that I'm talking about, these pro-industry people that are investing in these companies, you're helping to kill my people. So when we talk about divestment, yes, divestment works. And you as human beings pulling out of these 
industries that are having real human impact, it does help. May not right away, but eventually it will. And to me, that's good enough for now. Because that means we'll have fresh water for a little while longer. Because 80% of the world's fresh water is in Canada. When that water is gone, what are we going to drink? My uncle Al, the former chief of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, was chief for 35 years, longest standing chief in Alberta. He sat in a room of 150 chiefs in the 80s and said, there's going to come a time and day when, you're all going to ha when we're going to have to buy our water to drink. How many people in here buy their water to drink? How many people here will walk up to a lake and drink from it? There, that's a better question. Put your hand up. There was a slough outside. How many of you would go and drink from that? That means you buy your water. That's, that's not normal. There's nothing normal about that. So all these chiefs laughed at him. Here we are, buying our water to drink. Wilf Industry uses 6.1 billion barrels of our fresh, fresh water per day. 90% of that water is not recyclable. They are using four to six barrels of our fresh water to one barrel of tar sands oil. In my territory alone, they're producing over 50,000 barrels a day. In just one little small tiny area. A million and a half barrels of oil a day. The government wants to expand that 10 times. That's the projection. And I refuse to be one of those mothers who down the road, when disaster strikes, because it's going to happen, it's not going to protect anybody. My Uncle Al Lehman says when disaster strikes, it's not going to know race, color, or creed. And I'm not going to be that mom that's sitting there and my children are asking me, Mom, how come you didn't do anything? I won't. I won't be one of those moms because I was selfish enough to bring them into this world to have an obligation to them. They have basic human rights too, and they deserve to drink clean water and breathe clean air. We're addicted to oil. We're addicted to these fossil fuels. We are all economic hostages, pacifying ourselves with money. Whilst the government an industry plays environmental roulette with our lives. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me feel too good. The Swarthmore Board of Managers made all of these comments, and they asked us all of these questions in relation to divestment and why it's not feasible. And they're asking us, what else? Other than divestment, what else? What else can we do? Because that's not going to happen. Well, I say, prove to us that there's a sustainable industry. Then we'll stop. I'll stop going around and mobilizing people. The Beaver Lake Cree, Cree Nation will stop their lawsuit that they are currently winning right now against the provincial and Canadian governments. But until then, we're going to make sure that you lose your money because when that day comes, like I said before, they're going to realize that they, they can't eat their money. So, <clears throat> now I'm going to finally get to the PowerPoint. Like I said, I come from the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. And within the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, I come from Treaty Number 6. There's 11 treaties in Canada. We signed these treaties with the British Crown. Our treaty is of 1876, treaty number six. That's the treaty that I come from. And in that treaty, it says that as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow, you will always have the inherent right to go to the land, to hunt, fish, forage, to sustain yourselves. I also do work with the Indigenous Environmental Network. 
and I'm the Alberta Climate and Energy Campaigner for Alberta, uh, the Sierra Club Prairie chapter. So where I come from, there are companies like Imperial Oil, which I believe in the U.S. is Exxon. Correct me if I'm wrong. So Exxon is invested in in my community. They have illegally encroached on the Beaver Lake Cree Nation territory. In my territory, 80% of the in-situ happens. In-situ is the underground steam injection. Steam in, bitumen out. That's an energy intensive uh, process. So within that, they also have, we have a lot of above ground piping in our area. We see pump jacks like some of you might see farmhouses. These above ground piping are ruining the migration of the animals in our territory. And like I said before, we have constitutionally protected rights that say we will be able to hunt, fish, and forage. So when animals are being affected, those beings that cannot speak for themselves, when they're being affected, the law is being broken. When the animals come to these pipes, they cannot cross over them. They will not because they're foreign. We have cut lines through the forest, which the animals will not cross. These are seismic lines right through our traditional territory. Here's a picture from Google Earth of the Imperial Oil Cold Lake site, which is the tar sands deposit south of us, southeast. This is just one little, little small area in our territory. I want you to picture that. Probably this area is probably, I don't know, maybe the size of a city. All of those lines are above ground piping. Remember what I said about the animals. Remember what I said about the water. That's just one small area. So on top of the oil itself, the dirty oil itself. We also use water and natural gas. Those are pumped into the earth to melt the bitumen. And we have underground blowouts. We have caverns created under the ground. Oil seeps to ground level. Like I said, four to six barrels of water to one barrel of tar sands oil. 90% of that water is not recyclable. A million and a half barrels of oil are produced a day with a projected expansion increase to a billion barrels per day. And see, the thing with me, I go around and, you know, I try to mobilize people. Whereas we have pro-industry people that go around. Our natural resources minister, Joe Oliver, goes to the UK and he says, our, our Canadian Natural Resources Minister. Tar sands land is uninhabitable by a uh, human being. So you know, no community is being disrupted. That land he's talking about, that's our traditional hunting territory. That's the deliberate ignorance of our government. So what is he saying? First Nations people don't exist? We're not there? Well, I'll tell you, we're there. Me and my children live there. And I didn't come here to sell you anything. Because there's one thing that we have that pro-industry people will never have, and that's the truth. That's truth right there. I want somebody who's pro-industry to dispute that. I sat every once in a while, as First Nations women, we have a belief that we are the keepers of the water. It's not by chance women carry their, their babies in, in water, in the womb. It's not by chance when we talk about our one true mother that water is the milk of the earth. It's not by chance women cry and healing happen. As women, we are the keepers of the water. And every once in a while, I'll go down to Beaver Lake and I'll put tobacco in the water because that's what we do to honor and I'll go and I'll pray for those water beings. I'll pray to our Creator 
that everything's going to be all right, that we'll have clean drinking water. And I was sitting there this summer, just by chance I happened to take a picture, because I looked down and I thought, oh my God, that's not what I thought in my head, I won't say what I thought. Crystal, where your feet are, that's where the water line used to be. I'm only 30 years old. 20 years, that amount of water, where did it go? Medicines that in their purest form at one time, our old people talk about it, they could cure cancer. Natural acetaminophens like this that need clean, pure water to grow are now moving away from the water, are now becoming harder to find. A, that's an infringement on our treaty rights. B, that goes to show what industry is doing to our environment. I come from one of the most pristine areas in the world, the Northern Boreal Forest. We now have the Sahara Desert in Northern Alberta. And I went on a healing walk this past summer on my son's fifth, sixth birthday, and I thought, this is a good opportunity for my children. One minute? Okay. I don't know. Um, I'm going to try. <laughs> and, and I thought, my children are going to get, they're going to experience this work that I do. And to this day, I still carry guilt for taking my children out there on this healing walk. Because my children, my son got a bleeding nose. My 14-year-old niece had an asthma attack. Our old people say the fish don't taste good anymore. We're pulling fish from the lake that have tumors hanging off of them, moose with pus bubbles under the skin. We cannot skim the top of the water anymore and drink it. Children are being airlifted to the hospital for drinking contaminated water. That's a reality. This is what our future looks like. This is what your future looks like, too. So in 2008, the Beaver Lake Cree Nation filed a statement of claim in the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench. The legal action is going for a Supreme Court declaration that the cumulative impact of the tar sands infringes on the Beaver Lake Cree's inherent treaty rights. This would make the 17,000 plus permits issued to big oil illegal and worthless. So anybody that you know is invested in Exxon, you probably should tell them to sell their shares. <laughs> this is the Beaver Lake, <laughs> laughter's good. This is, this is the Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional territory. The yellow is the deposits, like I said. My nation is located just in the middle there, but this is our traditional hunting territory. What We have that inherent right. We have that right to say what goes on in this territory. We did not say that those, because we were now at over 19,000 permits, FYI. We did not say that those permits could be granted in our traditional territory. So we have say about what goes on there. There's an even more in-depth look at the leases and permits in our traditional territory. And it's a critical case because it's an environmental cr cr crime. The carbon released by the heavy oil projects will push the planet's climate past the tipping point. Wildlife is being drastically affected. 80% of the in-situ happens in our territory. And this case is winnable. The law is the law is the law. That's what the judges said. The law is clearly on the side of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. That's what she said. So in, in March of this year, we set historical precedents. The Beaver Lake Cree were granted a trial. This is the first time this has ever happened. And we go back to court um, March 22nd, where we will be granted our trial date. And we're looking at probably early January 2015. We have like $2 million to raise in a year. Um, that's the only thing that's going to keep us from winning this lawsuit. Um, and the government of Canada knows that. And they're using that as their only tactic, because that's all they have. Um, so when we talk about um, the things that are happening up in our territory. I, I'm, I'm going to be done. <laughs> um, we talk about the habitats. The fact that the caribou 
something that used to run in abundance in our area. We are now at less than 300 caribou in my area. 2025, they're saying there's gonna be 50. By 2040, there'll be 10. These are treaty infringements. Basically, what the Canadian government said in response to that, because they knew they were infringing on our constitutionally protected rights, is that they'll kill the wolves. That, that was their response to protecting the caribou. Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional territory is 38,972 kilometers. 34,774 kilometers of that is leased out to industry without the consent of the Beaver Lake Cree. And the Canadian government, unfortunately, has a duty to consult First Nations people. That's what makes us a little bit special in Canada because they, they kind of have to um, follow those. I mean, it's their law. They made it. So... Um, <clears throat> but we are currently at a point right now where Bill C-38 gutted environmental laws and Bill C-45 infringed on our rights uh, with our, our reserve land and um, took the Navigable Waters Act where one day we had two and a half million protected lakes and rivers by the next day we had 97 lakes and 62 rivers protected in Canada. Thank you Canadian government. And the, the thing about our lawsuit that makes it different is that we're not seeking a monetary settlement. We're seeking to stop development in our traditional territory as per our rights of 1876. Because in that treaty we said it was, it was a reciprocal treaty we would share. We were not going to cede, lease, or surrender our land. And it's to the depth of a plow. That's how much of the land we were sharing with, with our our brothers and sisters who came and settled. So anything below that, we have say over that. And we have things like the Lubicon Cree, where my friend Melina is from, where an oil spill happened larger than the Kalamazoo spill that happened in Michigan. Cancer affecting my friend Ariel's relatives up in her area, cancer, a rare cancer that's directly linked to industry. And then I, I sit in this board meeting. I sit in this board meeting and I share all of this. I don't know how you all feel right now, but I shared all of this. And then I was surprised. Because Swarthmore prides themselves on being socially responsible. Huh. And another comment that was made that I'm, I'll, I'll try to end with is um, one of the, the members said that Swarthmore said they have a fiduciary responsibility. Well, you know what? The Canadian government has a fiduciary responsibility too to First Nations people and we have the power to stop industry pipelines. Then I was told, I understand, I get it, but there's nothing more I need to see. We're going to continue. And she storms out of the room. Well, my response to that, because she took off so quick, was so are we. We're going to continue too, and so are you. <laughs> Divestment. They're going to kick me off the stage. <laughs> like, seriously, three more minutes. Okay. Divestment will cause a ripple effect. And you have the power to do that. We have a chief who was, oh, bye. Did I do something? Um, divestment will cause a ripple effect and you have the power to do that. In 1876, we had a chief, Big Bear. He refused to sign Treaty Number 6 because this was a time when we still tied our horses with a noose to the camp so they wouldn't stray. And the reason he wouldn't sign the treaty was he said, my, me and my people will not be led ar around with a noose around our necks. He took back his power 
And I want you all to do that too. Take back your power. You all are powerful young people. You need to stop feeling disempowered because you're not. Eventually, you're going to be sitting in those, in those seats. You may be sitting across the table from my children someday. And you need to remember these stories you hear. You need to remember that you have power. You all are amazing young people. And we talk about what does divestment look like? This is what divestment looks like. And just a quick FYI, um, we are having another healing walk July 5th and 6th up in the tar sands, open pit mining areas. You're all invited. Um, so with that, I'm grateful to each and every one of you. You give me the motivation to keep on keeping on. I'm grateful. Thank you.